how can we learn from the ways in which other people see? So these are the questions that drive me and have inspired me for a long time as an artist and an art museum educator. Um, and they have big implications right now in healthcare at a time when medical misdiagnosis, thank you, is probably the number one patient safety concern and also the leading cause of malpractice claims. Something that I've learned, I've learned a lot about misdiagnosis over the past 10 years, and one of the most interesting things I've learned is that uh, there, there are many, many factors at stake in misdiagnosis, with systems factors being the lead cause. But on a cognitive level, misdiagnosis is very rarely due to faulty information, faulty knowledge. It's almost always due to faulty data gathering or faulty data synthesis. In my opinion, misdiagnosis is often not a case, it, it's not a case of not knowing, but of not seeing. This played out for me on a very personal level as a kid when my sister was misdiagnosed and spent her entire childhood diagnosed with things like bipolar and schizophrenia. And I believed those misdiagnoses and it wasn't until age 25 that she was diagnosed with Asperger's. And so I saw my sister all wrong. So it's, it, that's kind of where this work all comes from for me and I, this, that has driven a, a big intellectual curiosity around misdiagnosis. So I've explored these questions of what it means to see in my own art, and also themes about how we can recognize uncertainty and certainty on a visual, sensory, nonverbal level. And also, as I said, um, as a museum educator, so I got to spend over 10 years of my life talking to people about art in gallery settings, kids, um, for a, a big part of it, as well as medical students and more and more clinical faculty as well. And that's kind of how I know everything I know about uh, what it means to see. And I've, I've learned a ton about the innate human capacities that we all have when it comes to making sense of our world. Um, oh, and so uh, seeing, so the things I want to share with you that I think actually really matter to healthcare. Um, or, or what, it, what seeing is really about. So, so seeing is um, it's about looking, um, really, really looking at a patient before deferring to the information in the file or what you're supposed to know. So uh, doctors are trained in narrative, and that, that's great, and that actually works most of the time. But sometimes what we see is different from what we expect to see or what the narrative, we, the narrative we expect. And we can actually learn this in art. And likewise, seeing is also about hearing and really, really listening to what somebody is trying to say when they might not quite have the words or the repertoire to express it and really capturing that. And we can learn that in art as well. It's about suspending judgment and staying curious in the face of the unknown um, throughout the process of, of gathering and synthesizing data. And lastly, it's about leveraging the voices and viewpoints of people who are different from you as a resource so that you can see the whole picture and see the things that you, that you're, due to your blind spots, you, you might not even recognize. So I, I, when a doctor does that really, really well, that's an art. And that art is largely untaught, and it's also the beginning to real healing for a patient. In my opinion, that art is a skill set, and, and by the way, my opinion is not only shaped by experience, but also um, I'm a voracious reader of the arts education literature. Um, and there's, there are actually pretty direct roots to this skill set in arts education and arts interventions. So I, I, I think that there are sort of four skill sets at play here and, and something that I call aesthetic attention. That's what I call this art of seeing. Attunement, like I said, really looking but also listening, so that, that ability to just tune in and take in information. Secondly, and really importantly, navigating uncertainty, being comfortable in, uh, at the edge of the unknown when things are ambiguous, when things are vague, when you don't know. Uh, navigating that ambiguous space uh, with confidence and curiosity. Flexible thinking, being able to hold in the mind multiple possibilities or interpretations at the same time. 
and really entertaining them, again, back to, to suspending judgment um, and, and just thinking across domains. And that also encompasses something that was spoken about earlier this morning, just the ability to translate um, into words, you know, taking in nonverbal sensory data and being able to put it into verbal or numerical terms that other people understand and value. And then lastly, group communication. So we really can't see the big picture without everybody's perspective. And that is also um, an art and learned in art. So, um, there's actually quite a bit of literature here uh, around art viewing in medicine, more and more in medical humanities. Um, this, is, this is getting integrated into curricula. Um, there's also literature in the K-6 uh, elementary education as well as museums on the impact of art viewing. Um, and uh, one method in particular, which is called the visual thinking strategies method, which is kind of the major home run I have found um, in my experience is, is what we're going to do today. And what we're going to talk about after the workshop -y part of this, we're going to talk about some of the research on this. Um, but just quickly, visual thinking strategies, um, it's, a, it's an arts-based method for group discussion. It's also a K-6 curriculum. I play with applying it in healthcare settings, but it's actually a sequenced curriculum three-year curriculum in elementary school education, developed by two people, Abigail Hausen and Philip Yenowin. Hausen is a cognitive psychologist, a developmental psychologist, who studies people's thought patterns um, in relationship to their level of exposure with art, what she calls aesthetic thinking. And Philip Yenowin, who was the director of education at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City for 10 years, um, who and, and the two of them came together, and actually they just uh, came out with a book l literally last month, It Hit the Shelves, about visual thinking strategies in, in elementary education. Um, so this is the method that I've, I've used at Harvard Medical School as well as a number of sites um, across the states um, and what we're going to do right now. And I, I, for me, I, they're, they're, because visual thinking strategies actually comes out of cognitive science and there's quite a bit of research around it, um, I, I think the other great opportunity with it is that it's highly replicable. Um, and in fact, we have a group here from University uh, College Cork Medical School, um, uh, Bridget Mayer and, um, Aud oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, Siobhan, <laughs> Siobhan Murphy. And they've, they've been engaged in a visual thinking strategies based program for their nursing, medical, occupational therapy, and uh, other schools of health within, at, at Cork. Um, and are scaling it to over 500 students at this point. So there's, there's some really interesting work going on um, ap applying this method. So now I'm going to stop talking about it, and we're just going to do it. Um, so we're just, what we're going to do now is just look closely at some art together and talk about what we see. Um, and then after, we're going to do this for about 25 minutes, um, and I'm going to ask Ronan to make sure I, that we keep an eye on the time. Um, and then we're going to reflect on it a little bit, and I'll share some more of the research findings. Um, so if you want to come closer, uh, you're very welcome to. This is a work of art that has a lot of detail, so if you even at any point in our discussion need to come up and get, get even closer to the screens, you're welcome to at any time. Uh, but there, the, really, the only rules for our discussion are to, um, to try to describe what you see, to try to see as others see. And if you don't agree with something, to bring that into the conversation. Sometimes people, I, I run into this in medical settings, sometimes people get afraid to, to disagree because they're afraid it's not professional or something. Nobody's grading you on your agreeability. In fact, your differences are going to make the conversation better. And I invite everybody in the room to participate. I don't know if the kids are still in this room. They were here before, but kids are, kids are great at this. Um, so we're just going to start by taking a quiet moment to look. Now I should have said earlier, you do not need to know anything about this picture in order to participate. But if you do, that's also very welcome, as are your questions. So I'll just take your hands, if you raise your hands. So what is happening here in this picture? Ryan? A mother 
just holding a swaddle baby. All right, so um, I hear you pointing out two figures. It's, it's as if a mother is holding a swaddled baby. What do you see that makes you say that? Um, well, the woman looks like a mother. I mean, she's a woman. Um, I guess just the, the way the second figure is, is put together, it just looks like a swaddled figure. Mom's embracing it, so it could be an adult too. But I'm a pediatrician, so I think baby. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So I'm um, noticing there seems to be some motherly qualities about yeah. this figure here. And also, you're looking closely at the composition um, enveloping this, what appears to be this figure over here, and, and noticing it seems to be assembled as if it's a swaddle. Uh, and what did you see that made you say motherly qualities about this figure? Well, she has some physical attributes that might suggest them. I mean, she's obviously a woman. Um, no, she's embracing this. So really, so really noticing this embrace um, as, a, as a big um, signifier of their relationship and, and thinking it, it might be a maternal embrace. And I also heard you say it could be something else, too. Yeah. Great. Yeah. What more can we find? Yeah. Here? Let's hear from you and then go. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, well, again, the mother equality. Is she pregnant again, perhaps? I mean, it looks as just in the shape there. Um, there is a circle there, maybe. Just trying to emphasize that she is a woman with the belly and maybe a circle of the womb. Okay, so you're um, picking up on this um, maternal issue and even wondering if there's a pregnancy, a question of a pregnancy, yep. um, noticing the shape of the belly, and, and really wondering about this circle here and if that could potentially signify a pregnancy. Is that okay? The other thing, though, about her face is that you can look at it two ways. One, her face, her public face is in profile, but there's a shadowed face behind it which is still hers, but it's shaded. It looks more hidden, whereas the profile face looks to be her public face. Maybe that's her private face, which is more hidden. Perhaps okay, so, so really looking closely at the way in which this face is put together and the treatment of, of light and dark on the face, and noticing we see a, a perfect profile that seems to be illuminated, and wondering if that face is, is the public face, but that we also see um, a more shadowed face um, that, back here. And again, sort of wondering about the symbolism here in public and private and what we're actually being privy to, to look at. Great. What more can we find? Yes. Um, well, it looks like a picture of two halves. So to me, the figure on the left is looking into a, a mirror or you know, something in the portrait, which seems to be reflecting an older version of herself from, from her top half, if it is the same person. Um, so that Great. That Alexa, I don't hear that. So, so bringing in the possibility that um, that this uh, is a figure reflected in a mirror, and uh, noticing a relationship between, uh, in particular, the belly, what what we see here, and what seems to be potentially reflected in a mirrored space um, here. And um, what was the other thing you said? Uh, with, with the top two halves, there's a definite difference of color scheme between the two halves. Okay. It seems to be an older color scheme. Around. Okay, okay, so wondering if this is a reflection, um, but the, the mirror is sort of telling a different tale about the person being reflected. Um, and, if, and, um, and what did you see that made you say, it, it's as if this, it, it could be sort of an older reflection of herself? Well, it seems darker. It seems more protected almost in a shawl, perhaps. Um, you mentioned the kind of the hidden face on the, the left there. There's also a, a mirror hidden on the, on the right side as well, but it's darker. So I suppose you might ask yourself, which is the true image of what this person is? Okay, great. So seeing a couple motifs repeated, though some aspects changed, but the repetition signifying to you that it could be a reflection, per perhaps predicting the future of the same of the same person. Great. So going from the idea of a very young baby to the idea of, of, a, of the future and, a, and an old woman. What more can we find? Yeah. Um, looking at the color difference of the face on the left again, and that face on the right doesn't look to me like child's right, or maybe represents the darker side of the one on the left. Are you, all right, so you're, this, this part, this what you're? Yeah, it's like symbolic of maybe she's embracing her 
darker side, and the color, the coloring from right to left is, is very different. Okay, so darker on the right. So we had talked about the idea of this this part of the face maybe being a, a private face. Um, you're you're bringing in a slightly different possibility of sort of a more darker side of oneself, and and the notion of actually just embracing that in, in this moment. What do you see that makes you say that? Um, I think the face on the right hand side is sort of menacing looking. It's not it's not a, a, a nice face to look at. There's a very kind of a crooked nose. It's almost witch like. And the coloring of that side is more somber and much darker. Yet there are similarities between the two in the lower half. And that you know the, the it seems like the breast. I don't know that green area on both sides is similar. So it's like a reflection again, like somebody else was saying, but it's, it's to me like the, like the duality of life, or there's something dark about that, that, but yet she's embracing it, and half her face is dark. Okay, great. So, so again, coming back to this theme of reflection of something that's also changed or different, um, but thinking that, um, that the, the, very, the somber-like qualities of the, the palette the color and also the, the jagged quality of the nose sort of associating with a witch um, changes that and brings in this idea of, of a darker side and, and one then that being reflected but also embraced at the same time. Okay, great. What more can we find? Yeah. The face on the right, well, it looks like a, a mask from a masquerade ball. It's kind of okay, what do you... Like it's, uh -huh. you know, hiding something. Okay, all right, great. So um, so noticing that this, we've been talking a lot about this aspect of, of the face over here and um, noticing a mask-like quality and, and suggesting that maybe maybe it's not that this person is, uh, is seeing her whole self, but maybe in fact hiding an aspect of herself uh, with a mask here. And what did you see that made you say mask-like or masquerade ball? It's just, it just those images of the kind of the Venetian Masquerade in the 16th, 17th century. It just, it just really reminds me of that image. Okay, great. One more can we find? Yeah. I just want to expand a little bit on what Jason had said here because I first saw two different women mm -hmm. and then I picked up on the same thing he did about looking at a reflection. But if you move down below the face and you spoke about the woman on the left being very pregnant like with the um, womb being there at the bottom, and if you look at the reflection, I immediately saw if we're talking about an aged version, um, that a faceless child, a more uh, an older child with two little p pieces of hair sticking up uh, at the bottom, the uh, circle there, yeah. Uh, it sort of looks like a, a more of a child than just a womb. Um, and then the other thing that struck me is that we keep talking about a woman looking into the future, whereas at some point I think maybe, maybe we're on the other side of the mirror and there's a woman looking at her younger self. Um, so, you know, because you, you can't really see what's on the other side of the mirror, but maybe that's what they're trying to show in this painting, that we are on the side that the woman's looking at. Okay, great. So I hear you really thinking through the positioning of the bodies and the reflections and sort of the logic of what would be where, and also bringing in this element of us, the viewer, and what's our stake in all of this. Um, so first, just coming back to this pregnancy issue and the idea of reflection um, and noticing that this shape here could, could sort of signify a faceless child. Um, and uh, so were you saying that that, that that connected with the idea of a progression in time or that was, that that was contradictory? Nope, that okay, so that connected to that. But then, but then we're kind of wondering about how a, a reflection might logically work. And, um, can we actually see what's in that mirror, or, um, or, are, tell me again about what? So the, if, if I want to make I'm sure expanding on the fact that that is a woman, an yeah. aged woman in the picture, and perhaps her child standing right in front of her, and they're looking at the pregnant woman. I see. Oh, I see. So wondering if the woman, if 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 the person who's actually reflected in this mirror here is not this figure, but in fact somebody in the space of the viewer. Is that? I, I think that just made it a little confusing okay. to me. But <laughs> Sorry, I want to make sure I really get it. <laughs> just essentially picture that the woman, that's not a, that's a mirror, but we're on the other side of it. 
Okay. Does that make any sense? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so so thinking so about us in the room with, with with the mirror and the woman and that we're on the other side. Okay, great. What more can we find? Yeah, Dee. Uh, so I want to bring up this tree. I mean, the one on the very left has nearly a halo around her head. It's very blonde hair. The hidden face is a second, and the pregnant belly is below that. So the maid and the mother, and then the very elderly lady in the mirror. The girl. Is it true? Okay, so starting to see the possibility of, in fact, three women in this yeah. picture. First, starting with um, the maid with the halo around it, yep. the original. To the hidden face with the belly directly <coughs> to that hidden face, and then the curve in the middle. And then what in the middle? Yeah, no, um, see the hidden face. Yeah. What, no, the, just the left? No, left again? <laughs> left. Yeah, that oh, hidden here. face. Oh, and the belly's right below that hidden face. I and see. And all the woman the actors okay. are right underneath that. So parsing out, really parsing out uh, the pots coming back to the divisions here in the space and actually wondering if it's in fact two people. One behind the other. What more can we find? Oh, and let's hear from Alan and then go back to you. Um, I just the one thing that I'm noticing is that if we're talking about a mirror or a looking glass, it looks like the woman on the left is actually reaching through it because you can see the shading in the mid portion of that arm, and the shading changes from where the arm begins to where the arm ends. So it looks like she's actually reaching through the mirror. It's quite quite striking. Okay, great. So coming back to this big gesture, which we talked about right up front, but really looking closely at how um, how the, the two and three dimensionality of it is depicted. And noticing that these details in here, that the difference in shading sort of suggests that um, it could be as if the arm is reaching through and into the plane of the mirror. Is, is that what you say? At, what you're saying and in particular, it's this funny shading in here that, that calls that into question. Great. What more can we find? Did I see this back? Um, just to uh, so you, I think it's more that we're not so knowledgeable of this. Um, that is a, is a vertical, <laughs> is a three woman face between the mirror and the woman on the left. It's a vertical line that goes down all the way to the bottom. And, and then there's another blue line on the right, the right of that mirror. That looks like these areas. But are these other mirrors? Okay, great. So you're noticing, um, uh, looking closely at sort of some of these details in the space, and there seem to be sort of these, these suggestive of sort of framing lines, these blue lines here that break up the space and are causing you to wonder if there's a bigger picture here that we're not seeing. Um, okay, great. What more can we find? this question of how many people are in this picture. And I hear you um, uh, feeling more certain than uncertain that it is in fact one person depicted in three stages of development uh, with this, uh, and, and again, sort of coming back to the splitting of, of this figure into two possible figures, but you're saying she's sort of all the same person throughout her life, uh, but this being sort of the young, fertile young, young maiden, and then the pregnancy issue sort of belongs to this figure more in the background, and then this is this is her much later in life. And what do you <coughs> see that that makes you say that? Uh, I think what it's trying to do is it's trying to basically with the mirror. It's it, it's the mirror is sometimes is used as a metaphor for time because it's basically a, a moment in time, and it's it's it's, it's a device to perhaps link. Okay, great. So I hear you, and I also hear you really wondering about what the artist in particular was trying to convey in this picture, and um, and and speculating that this this mirror could be like a device, uh, an artistic device used to convey this idea of one person developing over time, and that that 
could in fact be a reference to other other artists using a similar device in that way. What more can we find? Yeah. I think it's a, it's a representation of body self-image, how, how uh, a pregnant woman looks at herself. <coughs> uh, what you see in the left is what she really is, and what you see on the right is how she perceives um, how she is. Um, probably depression, uh, pregnant-related blues, or um, on, the, on the left you'd see, uh, on the body, you would actually see black stripes on the body on the left image. And the same, the green would be the indicator of the pregnancy, and she sees the pregnancy in the body, and she sees the impact of it um, uh, as, the, as the blue. It's very, um, the blue, as in I'm, I'm thinking blue as depression, and how she sees herself. Just person, uh -huh. something. Okay, great. So we've we've played with a lot of ideas around this notion of reflection. You're bringing in another one of of the idea of reflection of self-image, and ref in particular during pregnancy and sort of a woman's psyche and perception um, during that charged time. And um, you're also pointing out you're noticing some contradiction, especially in the belly area here, this white area that simply does not show up. Um, in this mirror area, but yet we have um, uh, this this green, um, or, or is it this blue that you're saying? The green here on the left yeah. is just in the room. It's and just then, here so and not here. The green is a sign of pregnancy. She sees the pregnancy in her body, nothing else. Okay, okay, so it's designating her focal point. And then I also heard you bringing in some color symbolism that just the blue in the mirror might sy symbolize her blues. I, I think it looks very much like a screen. <laughs> Scream okay. by Mook. And, and what do you see that makes you say that? That it reminds you of Mook's scream, that it's sex? The color pattern. It's okay. just the, it kind of goes, it has lots of depth to it. Mm -hmm. It's very dark. It kind of goes into, blue is a very kind of spectrum color. It's like it, 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 it can go into lots of, uh, t there are different tones of blue there, if you can see. It's like, I'm, I just see, it's, I suppose, I mean, pregnancy blues. That, that's the mm -hmm. only thing which I thought when I saw that. Okay, great. So noticing the palette within this shape is very blue and also very dark and more somber and even calls to mind most scream and that sort of raw emotion in that piece. Um, so yeah, just bringing it, bring, sort of again, sort of thinking about the possible narrative here and, and, and what is going on and bringing in this idea of, of uh, a woman interacting with herself in, and, her, and her pregnant state, in an emotional state in this mirror. What more can we Along with this guy, that's exactly what I saw from the beginning. Is this blue depression? The bit I can't figure is what's that green thing on her head and going down? Here. Yes. Okay. So I'm really wondering about that. <coughs> that's a great question. What do you? What is that thing? What do you guys think? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Great, so I'm hearing a lot of agreement from you and others in the room as well as this, this possible, this theme of depression and postpartum or pregnancy <coughs> depression. Uh, but, but you in particular are speculating that it, it could be as if this, this green area that we've been so puzzling about could in fact be the brain, like the source <laughs> of it. Um, great, a any other thoughts? And she's got a temperature yeah. and she's cooling her brow and she's encumbered by the woman. <laughs> Okay, so another possibility could be that it, it, that is sort of like a cooling, like an ice pack that she's. So it, it could bring in sort of the element of, of taking care of herself, trying to cool herself down. What do you see that makes you say that? Well, the arm around her could be the other person sort of comforting her because she's sick. Okay, great. So coming back to this arm, which we've thought about so many times, but uh, bringing in the idea that it could be a comforting and a caring for someone who's unwell. What more can we find? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I agree with the comments about the pregnancy and the dark feeling. I just have to wonder about the uh, possibly it's a bit like a green shoot, and she's getting the idea that the pregnancy, the new growth, is taking over her body okay. and maybe entwining her. And in particular, it's this that you're looking at. Okay, so so another idea that it could be like a green shoot. And what do you see that makes you say that? 
Well, it seems to be linked with the green stripes that we mentioned uh, further down below. Okay, so noticing a relationship it's between. Like a leaf on the end of the uh -huh. And I heard you say it's as if it's taking over her body. What did you see that made you say that? Well, I think the the, the shrouds that are sort of wrapping her, and she seems enclosed and, and, and trapped in, inside the mirror. Okay. Okay, great. So, so, and we kind of coming back to what Brian was saying about the, 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 the quality of swaddling, that wrapped quality, the way in which her figure is, um, is, is interlocked by these shapes sort of emphasizes this idea of, you know, if something's growing in there, just being, being completely taken over and trapped. Okay, what more can we find? Yeah, the you can then you. I oh. can't work out the, uh, the black and the red stripes in the middle. Um, it looks it almost it looks like it's coming from the figure on the left hand side, and it almost looks like sort of disemboweling, or you know, it's, it looks very dark and you know, very unpleasant, um, and yet can't make any sense of it. And, and excuse me, can't make any sense of it. Okay, you know, can't see what it is okay, to do great. With. So we have another sort of abstract blob that we're wondering what on earth is that thing and what is going on with it. You're pointing out uh, this this dark striped black and, and, and red striped area that also seems to, now what did you say that made you, what did you see that makes you say, it seems to emerge from this side and it also has a disemboweling, yeah. almost a violent quality. Yeah. What do you see that makes you say that? Well, it's just like her, her it looks like her chest and tummy looks like it's open. You, you could, you know, it's dark. On black, this side? On, and, and on and this side? The, yeah, just, just her, her, on the left, her, you know, her chest and tummy looks black with this, these, you know, coils, this circular red stripes, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's as if they're emerging from her, her tummy and, you know, and going across to the other figure, to the other side. Okay. Um, okay, it's great. It's very dark and, you know, and <coughs> violent and you know, unpleasant. And what do you see that makes you say violent? I think the red. Okay. The deep red. Okay, great. So lots more on color symbolism here, but noticing that this seems to begin from this open, chest and tummy area and emanate this way and has a could could have a violent or um as you said disemboweling or cutting cutting quality what more can we find let's hear from you and then yeah, and to me it looks as though the yellow face on the left is indeed another person but that person is actually holding the mirror so it's holding up that mirror to show her are you coming back to this yeah, the left hand side is the yellow face the shadow yeah. face yeah that to yeah. me is another person that's showing the woman but she is painting colours blending with the background. And so that may symbolise that the, the mother doesn't see her. She, 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 she sees her blending into the background. She's yellow, she's green. It's the same colour as the wall. Okay. And so she's not seeing anything else other than her own perceptions in that mirror. She's not seeing the rest of the world, just okay. herself and her negative perception of herself. Okay, great. So coming back to this idea of sort of the limited perception one has when they're when they're depressed and the sort of the loss of the big picture and and other people who might be there to support them and um, you're noticing a relationship here you're noticing a color relationship between this face and uh, the pattern on the wall almost indicating as if that person is not there they're just part of the background and they don't matter to this figure who's so intently looking um, at these other qualities in the mirror is that right what more can we find? For me, there's a very strong reproductive theme. Um, there's a very strong, very strong reproductive theme. Reproductive um, theme. Even of a face, it passes. There's not a lot of emotion. And we, is this the face? Yes, okay. but it's circular, so it's echoing the circles lower down, which could be the uterus. Um, it could be her breasts on the left hand side, the, the white, echoed on the right. Very, very strong theme of underlying yeah. reproduction, and I don't know. Does she look that unhappy? She's more passive. Okay. Um, but my eye is just drawn to all of these circles. Yeah. Okay. Great. So very conscious of where we talk a lot about where her eye is going, but your own eye taking in this picture and noticing it's sort of that there's this echoing, this rhyming of these circular motifs throughout the picture, and it's it's not t you know we see breasts and we see tummy. Um, and, and on this side, even suggesting that these could possibly be ovaries, and you're not sure which, but it's sort of all a reproductive theme. Um, so
So sort of just noticing that, that your experience of this picture is very much in that reproductive theme. And what did you see that made you say her face looks very passive? I don't see huge amount of expression on her face. It doesn't look happy. It doesn't look sad. Um, it looks resigned. It looks, <coughs> you know, it's not very animated. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, so just noticing, looking closely at this face in here and, and sort of looking for emotion or aliveness and kind of coming up dry, noticing it's sort of devoid of, of emotion, possibly even passive. What more can we find? You can get more. I, it, it, to me, it looks like a transition from the, the woman is in a way being buried in a kind of a coffin uh, and the mother is uh, emerging. So, you know, forevermore, it's, uh, you know, it's the, the death of the woman by herself and that now her, her uh, identity is going to be very much the, the mother. Okay, um, so, and I hear you sort of circling back to this theme of it's the same woman um, sort of reckon, reckoning with change and transition caused by pregnancy um, and bringing in this suggestion that it, it's the mirror could be a coffin and she's saying goodbye to herself as a young woman mm -hmm. um, in embracing her transition into motherhood. What did you see that makes you say that? What, and I, I think there's an acceptance of the transition as well with the arm uh, embracing all the, the stages. Um, I think, um, I don't know, something about the, I just looked at the, the shape of the uh, figure in the, uh, the suburban mirror and, and mm -hmm. after all the discussion, uh, I, you know, I just thought it looked, it could also be, uh, yeah. it's a little the shape of a, of a coffin being enclosed. Some coffin-like quality here. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll take just a couple more comments. But Ronan, how's our time? That's you. Okay. A couple more comments. Who's really urgent? Okay. Let's hear from you. these blue lines, which, um, which I think you had pointed out earlier, which had, to you suggested that the picture was maybe bigger, you're suggesting that these, it's as if these could be shutters, which associates with a window, it's a different kind of association, say from a, a coffin or a bassinet, um, and it's more, it's more hopeful, it's more a window into, into a soul, and what did you see that made you say that? Okay. Okay. So, so looking at oneself on a on a deeper level, um, but that these these small details how we had that we had touched on earlier sort of seem to change the whole quality of the mood. Okay. Great. Let, let's hear from you. Yeah. We'll wrap it up. It's possible that she's not pregnant. There's a figure on the left. You have that circle in her belly. Where you'd expect a child, but there isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's looking. Okay, so pointing out that this, um, this circle, which we had kind of been um, taking for granted as signifying a, a womb and a fecundity, um, noticing that it, it actually seems to be empty. And one possibility here is that she's not pregnant. And thinking about how that detail changes the whole story and, and makes us wonder if, you know, in fact, she's, it, it's, a, it's a sadness or a loss of a, a desire to be pregnant when one is not. Is that what you're saying? Any very last urgent? Okay, let, let's hear from you, and then we, 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 can, we can keep it up, and we can chat about it at the bar. <laughs> I've got a stained glass quality. You see it better on the TV screen than on that. It's almost, you know, uh -huh. you could almost imagine that it's a stained glass. It's kind of, okay. there's a kind of anti-Madonna kind of, or a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a, a complex Madonna image, really, in terms of, um, is, this, uh, is this a Madonna? Is she looking at, you know, herself uh, in the future with the, if you like, the birth of death or whatever, the kind of like the, the, the uh, Madonna's dilemma. Um, I just think the coloration is very, very, uh, very religious mm -hmm. because of the sort of the, the, the stained glass quality. Okay. Um, okay, great. So um, noticing a, a potential reference to stained glass or association with stained glass and 
in, and what did you see, I heard you talking about the color, but w what did you see that made you say that, the stained glass? You see it better on this screen yeah. here. Yeah, okay, it and so it looks, it appears yeah, on the it screen. Has a, it has a translucency. Yeah. And um, it also, the gaze is, is, is in the middle distance. Not yeah. So there's a kind of, there's a, almost an iconic rather than a, yeah. a, a personal kind of uh, imagery. Here. I see. Okay, okay, great. So, um, so, that stained glass quality sort of calls to mind the potential of a Madonna figure, which really, which again sort of changes everything from it sort of depersonalizes it and makes it more of a more of a spiritual story uh, or an icon uh, or you know a symbol of an experience. Okay, great. Well, this was a very very rich discussion. Thank you all so much. Um, what's our how much time do we have left, Roman? You're going to do an hour, and you've done the 45. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, I, have a, I, I, I do have some research to share with you on the impact of these kinds of interventions <coughs> over time. Uh, but, and, and so w we do have time to get to that. But first, I just want to hear some reflections from you about what that was like, your experience as, part, as learners, and also any questions that you might have. Yes. Um, I mean, the first thing I, I, I thought when I saw it, I just got this, um, it's like a, a tightening behind my eyes, this sort mm -hmm. of resistance, because it, yep. just, it was just too much going on, and I didn't, I couldn't understand it. Yes. And yet I couldn't get it to kind of yield to me, until yeah. I heard other people in the room saying, you know, oh, okay. that's what it is. And then, of course, yeah. it, all, it all made sense, but it kind of reminded me how I quite often look at art, which is, you know, yeah. walking around the gallery, yeah, next yeah. one, next one, um, and uh, that was really interesting. Yeah. But I think I would have struggled no matter how much yeah. time I had to spend with that on my own. I mean, we just spent a good 35 minutes looking at that together. Yeah. And isn't that interesting how you only feel like you begin to know? Yeah. Uh, and the questions are just beginning to form. But it, I'm curious to hear, so that your comment, Ronan, is reminding me how one of the ways in which works of art are kind of like people is they make, you know, sometimes they enchant us and they draw us in, and sometimes they're difficult and they cause an aversion. And, and for you, it sounds like it's just sort of like the more on the aversion <laughs> side of things, sort of like just too much going on and kind of loud and overwhelming, and you wouldn't have looked twice. But it was actually through the voices of other people's observations that helped you scaffold in and get interested, and then that changed for you over time. Um, and absolutely, that's something that, you know, this is all about looking at the overlooked. So don't be hard on yourself if you would have passed it by in, in the museum. But that, that's what this is about. And, you know, you, it sounds cliche to say it, but, you know, there's so much to see if you look. But you really only learn that when you take the time to, to look. And that it's very real work to do that. And that work is harder up front if the, if the work of art is giving you an aversion. It's more work. Just like it's more work if it's a difficult patient who's not who's locked up or being difficult than somebody who's who's very open and you know the, the thing I always think about with that is imagine if if this painting or a more enchanting patient uh, painting were asking you for painkillers like would you treat them the same way so that that's one one connection that sometimes comes up with medical students but absolutely that uh, that aversion quality and and sometimes I actually select works of art for that quality because it's a productive one. Uh, other thoughts about what it felt like? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I just found myself getting a bit impatient with uh -huh. all the interpretations and thinking, okay. can she just tell when we get it? Yeah. The <laughs> answer! <laughs> did anybody What's else answer? have that? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting to me, did you have a specific question? So one of the things about works of art is they, there are many, many things to be found and said and known about a work of art. There's, there is no one right answer. That said, there certainly are facts. Um, I'm curious, and actually your questions, I said right up front, your questions are very welcome and fair game. So how come you didn't ask questions? Because I Googled it. You Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have told you all to put your devices down. Well, so, so that's a great point about this work. And the reality is it can feel extremely dissatisfying. Uh, to, to, you know, it can get tiresome and feel un dissatisfying because particularly because it is so different from how we typically, you know, engage learners and, you know, seek our own knowledge. And in my opinion, that dissatisfaction is a very productive one, especially when you get into the territory um, of errors. Um, so I, uh, 
you know, this, this is Picasso. It's Girl Before a Mirror. It's 1932. But I don't accept that that's what this picture is about. You know, I, I, I think that there is, um, there's a lot more to be said and found. And actually, some of your questions that you had are very researchable questions. You know, who, who is this woman? Is it, is it her twice or is it... Uh, you know, was, was there a pregnancy going on in her life? Those are things you could actually research and engage students in researching. But um, does anybody know what the most commonly missed fracture in the emergency, in emergency medicine is? It's the second one. <laughs> it's the second one. And so, and that is referred to as, um, as search. I see, I knew someone was going to ask the right answer there. Search satisfying error, which is the, the human tendency to call off a search once you find something. And so that's, that's one of, you know, these are some of the most uh, common uh, types of cognitive errors that can happen in a state of search. Now, our desire to search and find out, like that's a good thing. That's what drives innovation. That's what drives ambition. So I'm not saying you shouldn't have that desire, but it's the poor management of that, uh, of that quality, which can lead to error. So in my opinion, you be, frankly, be, you know, ex just because this is su such a dissatisfying experience, you can leverage a very productive conversation with medical students and medical learners about how they, how they handle their, their desire to search and know and translate their curiosity into actual questions. Um, uh, some, uh, let's see, I want to, I'm sorry, my button's mixed up here. Um, one of the other big takeaways I, was, I wanted to share with you is this idea of how we look. So artists have trained their eyes to be separate from their judgment. And that difference between, you know, <coughs> describing what you see versus giving it a, uh, a judgment or a name um, also has great potential um, for, for managing errors. And we look... Artists, and artists have trained their eyes to, to be split in that way. We look differently at things when we think we understand them and when we don't think we understand them. When we look at something and go, what is that? That's a very different way of looking from when you, you think you have something all, all um, figured out. And that's one of the ways in which art is an incredible learning opportunity for the work of seeing and looking. is because you look at it and you go, what is that? But it's like a safe situation where nobody's hurting or suffering or dying. It's art. It's a joyful thing. It's interesting um, as opposed to stressful. So, you know, that's it, actually that's sort of the core piece of the concept of my work is that the art offers the psychological safety to practice these skills that you simply can't in the clinic or in the classroom where there are real bottom lines and you know people are in a, in a different space in their in their heads any other um, any other thoughts or reflections I have a question I don't know if you can answer it Alexa but in, in the context of this whole discussion about yeah. the changing face of yeah. medicine and first these futuristic projections yeah um, why do you think these exercises will be more important going forward? Yeah. And, and what does it teach us? And you know, I, I for me, it's about can. being it's about being better in search. And you know, patients and care providers alike are only going to be bombarded with more information and more data to sift through. And we need savvy, very data literate people who can <coughs> think critically and. Um, you know, going back to those skills of aesthetic attention, reduce ambiguity with keen perception, be in better command of that information, be comfortable navigating uncertainty. I mean, this is all uncertain new territory. And, and really just, you know, be more mindful and deliberate about their decision making in command of that information. I, you know, we also, I, I can get more into the research um, aspect of this as well. It's been shown, um, it's been tested a lot with, with children in K-6 settings, and the, there's an actual impact on critical thinking. Um, and we need critically thinking data literate patients as much as we do care providers. So for me, it's, it's all about that. But you know, it's also um, 
because I think so much of that data uh, is visual and there's so much imaging, we also, care providers, this is sort of secondary, but it is important that care providers need to be able to read images well um, and see the big picture of images, be, be more conscious of their own attention. Um, and there's a, you know, you will read an image very differently if you're looking for something specifically versus if you're saying what's going on here. You will find different things. So we need, it's, it's about that as well. I was recently in the hospital and I, I, I of all people, had the experience of, of having an x-ray technician not be able to read the x-ray where there was massive bleeding and she couldn't see it. And then a, a more senior person saw it. But the, you know, that's, a, that's an aspect of it as well, is just being able to read images uh, and being conscious of yourself as you do. So um, there are many, many convergences between art and medicine, um, for this aspect of it, um, it's, this, it's this sense of continuous search and being better in a state of search um, where, uh, where they converge. Um, any final, like, just reflections on that experience before we get into the research piece? Yeah. What was the name of the Oh, it was Picasso, Girl Before a Mirror, 1932. Yes. Absolutely, yes. There's nuances in it. Yeah, well, and, and that's a great point. There are many differences. And, you know, another major one is that there, there isn't the time in the clinic, really. I mean, that's, that's in my opinion, the biggest cause of the system's error is that just it's, it's, there's a lot of pressure. Um, but, yes, the, the patient is communicating back to you in a way that a work of art, a work of art is communicating visually, so it's developing a heightened sensitivity to how that happens nonverbally. And developing the skill of translation. But yeah, that, that's a major difference as well. And, and certainly, I mean, I think it, it, dep it all depends on what the, the goal of the educational activity is, but you could play around with, with other kinds of, you know, other, other kinds of art or visual or, you know, different kinds of media. Yeah, and it's just as an exercise, as a thought exercise within a group to remind you how much you can see um, and also the power of the multiple perspectives uh, as well. So, I just wanted yeah. to say a very brief thing. Um, the University of Limerick has actually started a humanities and medicine. It's a part of the curriculum in year three. I'm not sure if you've done it already, but I, 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 everyone has to partake in it. And uh, I have to say I found it a very enjoyable experience, first of all. But second of all, I think we could all agree that you can see there are certain skills that you can develop through this process. But it's also done in medical school is normally a very high pressure environment and it actually gives students a chance to kind of step back. It's not an examinable subject in terms of an exam at the end of the year, but students do have to produce something, whether it be a work of art or, or a, a written piece, some form of the humanities being produced in medicine. Some students are producing very short clips um, that they later put on YouTube. Of, um, it, it can be angry. The sky is really the limit with it, but um, I just I found it a very enjoyable process. And I do think the, the added benefit is that th you are developing your skills. I, I can't say yet if it's, if it's bene benefited me since I started working as an intern, but I do think down the line it will. Ron just brought yeah. the point as we were discussing here. This is really uh, an exercise in mindfulness yeah. and focus, yeah. which that is, it really has is. its own I can't lead with that because it sounds too woo-woo, but it, it's yeah. true. I mean, it's slowing down, taking the unknown, 
and, and be more deliberate, really, in your thinking and more aware of how your attention is being influenced. Which is so, I mean, you're talking about the attention economy and that the valuable resource of our attention and just being more conscious of where it's going and why. And, you know, th this is what Abigail Housen calls co aesthetic thought. And aesthetic, aesthetic thought what? is equally Say that again. Uh, aesthetic thought, aesthetic okay. thinking. Uh, it's, it's equal parts thought and emotion, you know, and, and um, those are the two essences of being human, and they're completely intertwined and completely influential as to where we look and how we decide to take notice of something as different or weird or not, and so developing consciousness around that is, is extremely <coughs> important and, and a big opportunity here. Um, yes? Can I just add an extra thing? Yeah. great time to do it because at that stage they know that there's all of this skills based stuff that they have to do and nobody's teaching them. It's hard, I've done a lot with first year students when, when they have these very strong expectations of, that are not in reality about what clinical practice is going to be like and they get very angry, you know, that there's, they expect certainty and they expect it now and that is not the reality in, in the <laughs> clinic and we actually use this as a way to help them come to terms with that. And they're, they're angry, you know, about it. Because, you know, and that's one of the biggest issues around critical <coughs> thinking is students come out of schooling with a very strong and false expectations of certainty when, you know, uncertainty is the prevalent reality. And we're not as good as talking about that. And, you know, there's been some really interesting research by Gordon Schiff about doctors and their willingness to talk about uncertainty. And they often don't disclose uncertainty because they think it's going to, work against them in a lawsuit, and it's the opposite. They, research has shown that it is, you get less lawsuits when you're more open and honest about uncertainty. So that's, that's a huge piece of it as well. Yeah. I, I do want to talk about these studies, but let's do one more comment. There's something I found really interesting yeah. um, as we progress through the discussion was, and you used the word influence a few times. Yeah. When somebody said, that looks like a baby. But, oh yeah, yeah. And we take what we see to be objective, and it shows you how very subjective and subject to influence it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly here to wrap up. So as I know, we I don't want to take up too much more time, but I just want to tell you briefly about. Um, uh, oh, okay. So this, there there's been quite a lot of of research on VTS impact on elementary age level as well as in medical humanities, um, especially on critical thinking and language skills. Um, I'm not going to have the opportunity right now to go into this deeply. By the way, I'm going to have my email address on the last slide here, and I'm happy to email you all any, any of these studies um, so, and t you know, talk more about it. Um, what I do want to focus on is, is two, two recent studies in the medical education literature. Um, uh, first, the study by Craig Klugman and a group at um, San Antonio School of, um, of uh, Health Professions, uh, where they showed that um, Students who went through a four-session uh, VTS-based intervention, um, not only did they they improved in their uh, uh, ability to take more time to look at both art and clinical images, but their tolerance of ambiguity, um, their sort of attitude towards ambiguity, improved as well as well as their outlook um, on healthcare healthcare and communication within teams. Um, 
This is the, oh, sorry, I, I lost a slide here, but this is the research outcomes from the class I've been involved with at Harvard Medical School for the last 10 years. Um, in 2008, we published these results in General Journal of Internal Medicine, um, and it was a double-blind, scientifically sound uh, test where we, we had uh, uh, 24 students enrolled in a 10-session class that was based on this work, as well as doing a similar methodology on clinical images. Uh, where the diagnosis was not known, but it was just about looking at those <coughs> images. Um, and then we, we were able to do a double-blinded pre- and post-test with other students who had tried to enroll in the class but didn't get into it. And we found that the students who took the class, who attended seven sessions or more, they made far more observations, almost 40% more observations on clinical images as well as arts images. They simply saw more and noted more. They also significantly increased in their usage of evidence to back up their interpretation. So they, they began to differentiate uh, that observation, fact, is separate from inference. That's like a pretty basic thing about observation, but not everybody, it's, it's tough to learn and nobody's explicitly teaching it. Uh, we also saw some very interesting uh, changes in their language and they began to use terms learned in art like shadow, contour, shading, in their descriptions of the clinical imagery. So their, their actual descriptions of the clinical imagery got more precise and more robust with this language. That was an interesting transfer. Um, and this is some information about training the eye. These are some of the awesome people I've had the opportunity to collaborate with and learn from over the years. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to wrap up by sharing some initial, this is uncontrolled pilot data from a workshop series I did last year at Boston University School of Medicine which was a very different kind of program. It was the purpose of the program was to offer the faculty a, a creative renewal experience. So what we did was actually train them in this method of teaching. And as, as I said before, visual thinking strategies is very replicable. So you can train other people to teach this way. Um, and um, I wanted to share with you some of the, I think actually some of the most interesting data that came out of this was in the needs assessment that we did. This is just highlights. I, I can, we did a poster on this this fall and I can send you this as well if you're interested. But um, we did a needs assessment and found that, that most of the faculty engaged in the workshop were engaged in teaching clinical observation. And few of them, only two of 19, had a deliberate pedagogical strategy to do that teaching. Um, and that, um, you know, that, then that was sort of the big outcome of the, of the, um, of the series was increased deliberate, and de deliberate practice and carefulness around the teaching and learning of these skills. Um, they also had some very interesting stuff around their understandings of uncertainty. So they went from, you know, ta they started talking about in the data how ambiguity is interesting, how you see more in an ambiguous space. Um, so there, there was a renewal aspect there as well. So I'm rushing in the interest of uh, letting the, getting, getting on with Ed's um, amazing work uh, and experience, but I will, so I'll stop here um, and just leave you with this quote that is the function of art to renew our perception and what we are familiar with, we no longer see. So thank you so much and please be in touch if you want. <laughs>